Hi, I'm Phil Dawson. I'm from Cradle at Deakin University. I'd like to talk with you about cheating, what we can do about cheating. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, which are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I'd like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that Indigenous sovereignty has not been ceded. When I talk about cheating today, I'm going to be building largely off what's in that book there, Defending Assessment Security in a Digital World. Uh, that book is in a lot of Australian uni libraries as an ebook. You can get it, you can download chapters, etc. Go for it if you like the stuff that I say. Um, I'm also going to be sharing a PDF with some references backing up some particular things that I'm talking about, further reading, etc. Because this talk's not going to be in PowerPoint today. Um, I'm going to jump over to my browser. Yeah. So. I'm going to talk about cheating. For me, one of the really big important papers about cheating that's come out recently is this paper by Curtis et al. Um, to me, it really is one of the standout findings that goes beyond sort of simplistic self-report of cheating to try and say, what's the real rates of, of cheating if we, if we try and control for some of the challenges of student self-report? From this and from my read of other parts of literature, I do think that around 1 in 10 Australian higher ed students are engaged in some sort of cheating somewhere in the course of their studies. Now, for me, that's a, that's a big problem. Um, when students cheat, we can't hand on heart say that they've met the learning outcomes for the degrees that we award them. And when we can't say students have met the learning outcomes, well, we shouldn't really be awarding them degrees. Now, I get that cheating has complex social causes. And, and that's not exactly where I live. So, you know, if, if you were hoping for a discussion of neoliberalism or something like that, that, that's not me. But what I can talk about is approaches that we have access to, to try and address cheating. Now, how can we kind of structure something like that? Well, well I'd like to propose to structure it in a bit of a tier list. You might be familiar with tier lists, you might not be. It's a popular genre on YouTube, on forums, all, all sorts of places that people hang out. Um, if you search tier list on YouTube, you've got heaps of them. This first one here by Anthony Fantano um, is a tier list of Eminem's albums. And you'll see it starts with S and then A, B, C, D, E, F. And that is the YouTuber Fantano going through and saying, well, these are the best ones. They go on the S superior or superlative, or I don't know what S stands for. I don't think anyone knows what S stands for with these. Um, the best ones go up there with S. The next best ones get A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F. It's a way to avoid having to exactly rank things and just say this, this class of them are just better than these other ones. And these ones down the bottom... For Eminem's albums, you probably shouldn't even bother listening to. And for anti-cheating approaches that I'm going to talk about, maybe we shouldn't try to do them to stop cheating. Now, tier lists are applied for heaps of different things. Let's have a look. We've got Eminem with a tier list here. We've got World War II performance. So, the performance of, of different countries in World War II. We have breakfast cereals. Yeah, people ranking breakfast cereals. We've got Dangerous Australian Wildlife ranked in tiers. Gaming consoles. Oh, gosh. Best and worst rappers. Chips. Pizza. Oh, my gosh. So many different things. Anyway, people rate all these things in tier lists and that the genre is you construct the tier list in the video and discuss your reasoning behind it. Now, I'm about to go do that. I'm going to give you sort of the, the Phil Dawson rankings for these things. They're somewhat arbitrary, you know. Anyone's rankings in these ways are arbitrary because it's kind of hard to compare different types of intervention and the different types of evidence that underpin them. But let's have a go. All right, I'll jump over to my tier list. Here is my nice blank tier list template that I've pre-populated earlier with a bunch of different interventions that we can talk about now. Okay, let's grab one. I'm going to grab the classic academic integrity modules. Y you know, if you're trying to deal with cheating, the 
the most common approach in Australia seems to be to offer an, anti, an academic integrity module. When I was an undergrad, when I was in first year back in 2001, I took one of these. These have been around for a long time. You might think there'd be strong evidence that they're effective if they're so prevalent. And depends on what you mean by effectiveness, I guess. They're very effective at fulfilling a certain requirement uh, on reports to TEXA about doing something about academic integrity. But as far as actually reducing cheating, I'm not aware of evidence that academic integrity modules do that. Now, they're a good idea. You know, we should educate students on academic integrity, but I was kind of hoping after 20-something years we'd have good evidence that they, they work. Um, so I'm sadly going to chuck academic integrity modules at C tier. C is, you know, decent things we should be doing, but definitely not, you know, massively effective. So we should do these. They're just not hugely effective. Okay. Learning outcomes. Now here I'm talking, really thinking about the learning outcomes that are used in a particular task and, Deciding, you know, are these the most appropriate ones? Are there lower level learning outcomes that are bundled into this that are making it vulnerable to cheating? That sort of thing. Because assessing lower level learning outcomes, you know, your unistructural, your your multistructural, um, those sorts of things in a solo taxonomy, things that require, you know, often memorization, is not something we can really do fantastically and and believe that we are you know, really addressing cheating, especially as we've moved to online assessment, e-assessment through the pandemic. Um, it's really hard to assess those lower level learning outcomes. So like really, really carefully thinking about learning outcomes, I'm going to put that at a B because doing that can avoid some, some really challenging situations. Okay. Next one I want to talk about is remote proctoring or lockdown browsers, or that sort of thing. <clears throat> These really became much more common during the pandemic. Um, there's so much, you know, literature around it. Um, I can give you a dozen studies that show that when students sit remote proctored exams versus unproctored exams, they get lower grades in the remote proctored exams. And, you know, the argument is that it's, it's probably because of less cheating. I, I'm willing to buy the argument that remote proctoring is probably a deterrent to cheating. I'll buy that. I don't necessarily believe that remote proctoring is great at detecting cheating, that at seeing if cheating's happening. Uh, I've tried to get remote proctoring companies to let me run a study where I try to cheat to, you know, test out, does remote proctoring detect cheating? Well, they won't let me do that. Um, and I can't find any sort of independent peer-reviewed evidence in support of that. So, it's kind of a mixed bag there on the effectiveness of dealing with cheating. Then we've got some other sort of cons there as well around, you know, surveillance, privacy, uh, some concerns around inclusion, and, you know, some other concerns about continuation of outmoded assessment practices. They kind of let us keep doing exams and not everyone thinks that's a good idea. So it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag, remote proctoring. Um, look, because of that, I'm, I'm putting proctoring as a B. It's, it's effective. I do think remote proctoring is effective at addressing cheating. We do have evidence. But it comes with some cons as well. Now, you'll see here, just in these first three things that we've put on the tier list, we've got some very different types of approaches, don't we? We've got a, a conceptual approach here about really doing assessment design in a careful way. We've got what I would call an assessment security approach. So something that's that's adversarial, that's coming from the perspective that students may cheat and we might want to detect that. Um, and then we've got an academic integrity approach, you know, a positive, proactive approach that's about developing student capability. The ways that we might compare evidence across these three are challenging, you know, how do you compare the effectiveness of those three? And this is the challenge of the tier list, trying to place things and say, what what's better than what? I do think, you know, just on strength of evidence, proctoring has more strength to it than academic integrity modules. But 
I can understand people's reluctance about remote proctoring and, and the decision to not use it in some circumstances. So it's a, it's a challenging thing. All right, let's, let's go to something else. Here I've got honor codes. Okay, the, these are less common in Australia. So honor codes are getting students to sign on and say, I understand what academic integrity is. I will act with integrity. And, and for that, students who sign on to the honor code often get some, some extra privileges. There's strong evidence that honor codes reduce rates of cheating. However, the reduction is quite small. So this is an interesting one. Um, in the US, these are used in a kind of dangerous way sometimes where they're the only approach that's used to deal with cheating. And I think that's really problematic. But there is strong evidence that they have an effect. And I can't really think of much that's negative about honor codes. So I'm going to put them next to academic integrity modules. Probably got stronger evidence than academic integrity modules of their effectiveness but they're still not at that sort of higher level of, of having some bigger effect. Okay, what else? Unsupervised multiple choice questions. This is something that's sort of a, a different type of thing. This is a, a terrible idea. Uh, if you want to do high stakes assessment online, don't do unsupervised multiple choice questions. We just know that students collude on them, that questions end up leaked out to other places, that you get someone else to do it for you, all sorts of problems. Not a good approach. So I'm going to chuck that down on F. Now, I doubt anyone's doing unsupervised multiple choice quizzes with the desire to address cheating. I hope no one is because it's just not a great approach. But I wanted to mention it there as a practice that's, that's really problematic. Okay. Open book. Open book's an interesting one. So the argument with open book is that if we set closed book tasks, we have to enforce it. Instead, if we set open book tasks, that's one fewer restriction that we've got to enforce for students. Um, setting open book tasks kind of works in with learning outcomes. You know, when you design open book exams, you have to be assessing those higher level learning outcomes. You can't keep it at the lower level because people can just have it in the book. So it's it's kind of on that same level as um, learning outcomes. It sits there as a, you know, a cool approach, not perfect, not applicable everywhere, but it is another tool in the arsenal. Um, so yeah, I, I would say think about open book. All right, what do we got here? Content matching. Okay, content matching. Now, I've put content matching here rather than text matching or even a brand name like Turn It In um, because I wanted to kind of zoom out a bit. These are tools that check what students submit against sort of other work in a kind of verbatim way to check for copy paste, that sort of thing. I think content matching is essential. I think we've got to have it. Um, it's not perfect. Students know ways around content matching now, but we can trace the reduction in copy-paste plagiarism in the 2000s back to the rise of text matching tools. So I think uh, content matching's got to be in there. Um, but sort of the, the ways people are getting around it... Um, and the fact that it, it kind of doesn't apply to all task types, so it's kind of niche just to text-based. If you're doing text batching, obviously uh, computer software, uh, computer code, content matching exists and other things as well. But it's fairly task type specific. So content matching goes there. Um, what else? Okay, better exam design. You know how there are stupid mistakes you can make with exam design, like say, um, if you're setting high stakes multiple choice quizzes, reusing last year's ones, and not um, having a big bank of multiple choice questions and not randomizing the order, those sorts of things fall into, you know, avoiding those mistakes here. But also things like you know, computer generated questions around a theme, say calculation type questions, um, all this stuff clever people who think about exam design think of. Little incremental things that can add up to a fair bit. Um, I'm willing to put that on B. Getting a lot of Bs. Let's, let's go for something that's not B. 
All right. Going to go for bans. Okay, bans. Um, <clears throat> during the pandemic, there was an argument in Times Higher that we should ban essays because that will stop essay mills. And I guess it stops essay mills, but essay mills were never the problem. It was the broader phenomenon of you know, contract cheating, students getting other people to do their work for them. Bans of individual task types just remove tools from the arsenal for assessment designers. I don't think they're a good approach. They're not effective. They're on the F tier. There you go, bans. All right. Something better. Swiss cheese. Swiss cheese is there to represent this idea of having multiple layered approaches, like layers of Swiss cheese. Uh, we saw this play out in the pandemic where um, rather than just using masks or just using social distancing or just using vaccines, we've deployed layers of approaches that, that together do a pretty good job uh, of helping us deal with the pandemic, or at least a better job than any one intervention on its own. Um, I'd go to Rundle, Curtis and Claire as the first people to adopt a Swiss cheese model for uh, dealing with cheating. I think Swiss cheese model is S tier. It is superior. It helps us think about, oh, we might want to try and layer approaches rather than searching for the perfect approach. It's a way of changing our thinking. Very big fan of Swiss cheese approaches. Tasks students want to do. Uh, the radical idea that students might cheat less if they're doing tasks that, that they want to do. I think this is, this is solid. I think this is, uh, this is A tier. Why is it A tier? Well, <clears throat> there's a few reasons. One of them is, say, the uh, study by Brettag and colleagues, really large study of Australian university students, about 10,000, asked them what task types do you think students would be less likely to contract cheat on or more likely to contract cheat on? And we could look to that and maybe do those tasks, listen to students about the tasks that they would be more or less likely to contract cheat on. Or you could go a more theoretical approach, use something like self-determination theory, as some scholars have, to, to argue with evidence that when students' sort of needs are met in that assessment context, they're less likely to contract cheat. Uh, when they're doing tasks that, that meet those needs of autonomy, relatedness, sense of competence, those sorts of things. So I think, yeah, tasks students want to do make straightforward sense, supported by theory, supported by evidence. Okay, VIVAS, Interactive Oral Assessment. I really like these. Uh, we did a small-scale study at Cradle that we haven't published because the results were too good to be true, where we got some students and paid them to become really familiar with either a cheated piece of work or one of their own assignments and then go and talk to a deacon marker about it. And the, these panels of deacon markers, actually, every single time these panels of markers were able to tell if the student was talking about their own work or a piece of work that we'd bought from a contract cheating site. I also know from my teaching uh, back when I taught computer science, we'd sit down with students when we marked their work and we'd talk with them about the work. We'd say, hey, what's this function do? Can you walk me through it? And we could tell if the students had written the code themselves or not. I think Vivas are really solid. I would like to see more evidence. Resource intensive, yes. But if we go to that sort of Swiss cheese approach, you know, maybe they're not the approach that we use all the time. They're something we deploy sometimes. Um, I mean... Stylometry is another promising one. Let's think about stylometry. So stylometry is getting students' work and comparing the style with their previous work, often using computer tools. Uh, we've done a study of one stylometry tool. Uh, ours was Turnitin in authorship that we used. Uh, that, that study was paid for by Turnitin, so you should always question that. We didn't make any profit from that study, but it, it's worth noting that they paid the direct cost of the research. We found that when run through Turnitin authorship, the, the student assignments were run through that. The markers were better able to tell if it was contract cheating or not. So I'm inclined to think that, yes, yeah, stylometry probably works. There's other studies in the literature suggesting it works. 
Um, it's a nice scalable intervention as well. So it can be run without any extra resourcing. And unlike, say, remote proctoring, it's not as invasive. I mean, there still is the argument that producing a profile of you and your writing is somewhat invasive, but not the same as having a webcam watching you for a few hours in your home. So I'm going to put stylometry up here in A. Okay. Document properties, another sort of computer-based approach of looking at student work. Document properties is, you know, checking all of the authors that have edited a student assignment, the amount of time has been taken for revisions, a whole bunch of stuff like that that people who investigate contract cheating cases do. This seems really solid and is often used in evidence for contract cheating cases. So I'm, I'm willing to back this a lot and put it up in A because it just seems talking to people who do the investigation work, this seems really solid and, and really strong evidence and it's not invasive. You know, this is stuff that's just within your Word doc anyway. Okay. What have we got? Central teams. I really like central teams. I'm putting central teams up in S. When I say central teams, I mean having a central function at the institution that takes care of uh, academic misconduct cases, looks into cheating, looks into contract cheating, etc. This is now expert work that is a profession in and of itself within higher ed. There are people who are very expert at this. Your institution hopefully has some of them. If not, try to get some of them. They can do it more efficiently, more expertly, they can have better processes that are fairer with students. I really back having centralised um, academic misconduct teams at universities. Okay, reflective practice. Oh, I, I have mixed feelings about reflective practice. So people lie on reflective practice. You know, I don't know about you. Have you ever done a reflective task and kind of embellished it? Uh, my favorite paper title on reflective practice is they liked it if you said that you cried because, hey, that's, that's what we do. We embellish some sort of narrative of personal growth. But in the big study that uh, Brett Hag and colleagues did where they asked students uh, what task types do you think students would be more or less likely to contract cheat on, reflection ranked lower. Um in our work on contract cheating, when we've asked markers to mark contract cheating assignments and real assignments, we haven't told them which is which, they've thought the reflection was done really, really poorly. So I, I don't know. Because on the other hand, I've heard from some people that contract cheating sites are getting really good at doing reflection now. So I feel really dubious about reflective practice. I'm going to give it a soft C, but... I feel like I could punt it down to D if the sites get better at um, producing this reflective practice. All right, legislation. Um, you might have followed the debate around the TEXA amendment that gives them criminal powers to prosecute, um, uh, to go after businesses that provide cheating services to students. Look, I think it's got a deterrent effect perhaps. You know, knowing that something's illegal might make students less likely to engage with it. I'm going to give it a C. It's not got strong evidence that it works to actually reduce cheating cases. Uh, I've been a co-author on two studies taking quite different approaches that have found through various evidence that you know, legislation's probably not going to be that effective. So, yeah, I'll give it a C because it's not hurting. It's got a potential deterrent effect. I just haven't seen the evidence that it works. All right, staff training. All sorts of staff training exist. We've done a study where we trained staff on how to detect contract cheating and brought detection rates up to around 80%. That's, that's pretty powerful. Um, now, this is just developing a hunch. This isn't going through and, and proving a case. But again, training can exist on that as well. There's more and more reason to believe this is an expert space where people do need to know things that aren't intuitively figure outable, that they do need that sort of staff training. So I'm going to rate staff training quite highly. I'm going to put staff training up as an A. Face-to-face -face exams. You know, sometimes we do need to know what students are capable of under particular circumstances. And if we've got 
remote proctoring as a B, I'm going to put face-to-face exams as a B as well. Um, you know, different set of vulnerabilities in face-to-face exams, and they're not necessarily more secure than take-home assignments, but there is a role for them in a sort of anti-cheating assessment security space. Site blocking. This is you try to go to a contract cheating site and the computer says no because the firewall won't let you there. Look, it, it's okay. Um, I'm going to give it a D because, you know, I don't think it works that well. I think students can bypass it. I'd like to see a better version where we refer students to legitimate support services rather than just giving them the firewall page. I'm also a little worried that it sometimes blocks staff from being able to investigate these things when staff also have their access blocked. So it's a D. And similarly, authentic assessment's a D. Now, I love authentic assessment. I'm an assessment for learning researcher, but as an approach to deal with cheating, there's just no evidence that it helps. And there is evidence that students are able to get authentic tasks produced by contract cheating sites. Um, you know, I, I just I just can't push it as an approach to deal with cheating. If I were giving you a talk about assessment design, however, I'd be all about authentic assessment. So it's not bad. We just shouldn't put all of our faith in it as an anti-cheating approach. Reusing tasks, using last semester's multiple choice quiz this semester, terrible idea. Um, goes down the bottom in the F tier. Uh, go on to somewhere like Course Hero and search your unit code, subject code, whatever, and see what's up there, which of your tasks are up there and, and what sort of answers are up there for it. We sadly need to move beyond reusing tasks now. They're out there. They're all burned. Amnesty or self-report. Ways for students to come to us and say, I have done something that I'm not proud of. How can I make this right? I think we really need to offer this to students. I'm going to put that up in S tier. It really is superior. We need to have ways that students can learn from their mistakes and things like, say, the University of New South Wales Courageous Conversations approach, various approaches rooted in restorative justice, you know, those sorts of things. They're us acting with integrity. They're allowing students to rebuild their own integrity they're less resource intensive than horrible sort of committee processes where we have to prove things. They're less painful for everyone involved. And they might even increase the proportion of cheating that we actually detect and deal with and hopefully stop from happening again in the future. And finally, programmatic assessment. Now, I think programmatic assessment is very clearly S tier. Programmatic assessment is the idea that we zoom out from individual acts of assessment and say, where are the key moments of assessment in this degree? And how, are we, how do we map those to the degree level outcomes? How can we be sure the degree level outcomes have been met? Using this as an assessment security approach is saying, where are our key summative moments and how are we sure that we're assessing those with security, with, with some sort of assurance that we know that students have done the work themselves in the conditions we require? Now, I'm not saying do exams in those moments. I'm saying do things that you believe will help with assessment security. I see a big role for interactive oral assessment or VIVAs in that. Yeah, VIVAs might be too resource intensive to do all the time, but what if we zoom out to the level of the degree and we focus our, you know, scarce assessment security resources on those times when it really matters? And that's why I put programmatic assessment up at the S tier. Now, You can see here, we've got so many different approaches, so many different types of evidence. I encourage you to have a look at the PDF and see the references that are there for some of these. Um, I'd also really love to hear in the Q&A and chat and on Twitter and anywhere else you can get in touch with me, how would you rank these things differently? What would you move around? Um, Is there anything on here that you think is really missing? Really look forward to having a chat with you about that and Yeah, let's try and deal with this problem of cheating together.